I just want to take a moment to thank all of you for showing up tonight. I know that you braved the wind, the rain, the cold, because this is an important topic that impacts everybody in this room and so many in our communities. We have a war that's been waged upon people that are in poverty, people of color, people that have been traditionally disenfranchised. They call it the war on drugs, but it might as well be the war on poverty. It might as well be the war on full participation in democracy. Uh -huh. It might as well be the war on black people, Native mm -hmm. Americans, Asians, and others that have been traditionally disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. That's what it might as well be called. Yeah. And at some point in time, the people need to stand up and reevaluate what's happened, what's occurred, what is present, and decide that fairness and justice must prevail, and illnesses need to be treated as such, and legalization ultimately might help others to actually get help for those things that actually ail them, and that we might actually recognize the medicine, medicinal value uh -huh. of some things that have been traditionally used by some cultures to heal. Yeah. That's why we're here today, to have a frank and candid conversation about the disenfranchisement of people because of the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. That's why we're here today. I hope and I believe that we are gonna have an outstanding conversation that uh, everybody here, once you leave, will walk out and tell five or six people about what your experience was here at this moment that everybody here will talk a little bit about what a buy bust is and how it is targeted towards people of color, that everybody will hear will talk about how this impacts housing, mm -hmm. how this impacts the opportunity to raise children, how this impacts the ability to climb out from the cracks and actually get a job. Mm -hmm. I hope that everybody shares that as they leave this room. Mm -hmm. Now I wanna take a moment to thank the ACLU for participating in this and leading the way, and I also want to thank my executive board members from the NAACP who are not here today, who support this as well. Mm -hmm. I want to point out that Life Enrichment Books is in the back. The That's NAACP right. nationally a couple years ago had its 100th anniversary, and they are selling that 100th anniversary back book there in the back. I want to thank all the ministers for being here today, and I see plenty of you in the audience because I know that you can reach back to your congregations, talk to them about what the real war on drugs really equals, and help everybody to reach out to one another as human beings, so thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. I wanna thank those that just decided to come here because they have some person that they care about in their life who's been adversely impacted and treated as a suspect because of the war on drugs when they hadn't done anything wrong at all. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you all for being here, and it's really a powerful group of speakers that we have here today. Now, first I'll start with Pastor Carl Livingston, who many of you already know. I want to thank you so much, uh, James Bible, for your uh, introduction, your participation in this event it's so important whenever the NAACP with its storied 100 year plus history uh, gets involved in anything uh, on a larger scale to help our community because they bring such power uh, to play. There are three major things that I'm here for. The first one concerns supporting what James Bible and the NAACP is asking of the ACLU and this community, and I'm gonna leave it to James to ask it in his own way. Uh, I don't, I'm not his mouthpiece, he speaks better than I do. But I am so supportive of what he is about that any of his efforts for uh, 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 the end of drug laws uh, across the board, any of his efforts to bring equal justice in our criminal justice system. Any of his efforts for clemency or for uh, going after certain of the people who say they are representing the people, representing our community, and are really not. Any of his efforts along those lines, to the extent that I understand them, I wholeheartedly support them. And it's past the time for us to be divided, for us to be separatists, for us to have an attitude, and all of that, each individually working and not working together. I want to work together with you 
I don't mind following in some of the things that you're leading on. And I hope you can work together with some of the others doing the same thing. I'm in support of that, and I hope the ACLU leaders like Ms. Ms. Holcomb back there. Where's Ms. Holcomb? I saw she is so important in putting this together. Uh, let y'all give, give her a hand clap. I felt very old when I found out that I used to teach her husband. <laughs> Lord, help us today. When somebody comes and tells me, you used to teach my grandparent, I'm going to instantly retire. <laughs> Uh, he's looking good too. That's that's the thing that helps me. He, yeah, he's uh, he's very young, <laughs> and uh, I hope he's smiling. I am also here to support what the ACLU's effort is uh, that has a lot to do with why you're called to this place. Uh, there is a bill right now, 502. Is that the is that the number uh, that we're hoping you're supporting? And you might ask, why is a preacher supporting? Uh, a, a, uh, uh, a bill that would legalize marijuana. Not because I am promoting marijuana use. No, 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 no. It's because I feel that marijuana use is like cigarette use. There is scientific evidence of its medicinal uh, qualities to at least relieve pain for those who are going through chemotherapy and things like that. Besides, I got too many professional friends that always want me to leave the party a little too early. <laughs> me too. And as I'm heading out, I'm talking about attorneys, accountants, doctors, and all Not the rest of them, business owners. I seem to recall that when I'm leaving, smoke starts emanating from the windows. And they ain't smoking cigarettes. And It's about as pernicious as cigarettes. I know that there's a scripture that says that your body is the temple. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that we're to take care of our bodies. But that doesn't only make marijuana questionable. That makes cigarettes questionable. And you don't want to outlaw that, do you? That makes overeating questionable. And you're not trying to outlaw that, are you? That makes a strong drink questionable, right? Especially too much, or too much wine, or uh -uh. beer. Uh, too much of those energy drinks. Come on, somebody. And, 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 and so we gotta be careful how we draw our lines, scripturally and religiously, so that we're able to offer the people the kind of moral guidance that helps them structure societies that really benefit the people. And then on the other hand, we got too many folks that are being swept up, drug enforcement uh, efforts and all, particularly in our community where they're doing still broken windows policing Giul Giuliani style, where they're doing dragnet policing in our community and barely policing in other communities. And also many of our folks have arrest warrants, have tickets, have just the being stopped and frisked. I got the reports. I mean, if you want to press me, we can talk about uh, just the report that came down uh, this last year, the preliminary report on race and, and Washington's criminal justice system, in which Supreme Court justices were participating in that, in which they concluded that we find that in the state of Washington, implicit discrimination is prevalent. Yes. They use the words like much of it. So it's not intentional discrimination. And I like to change that and say it's not provable intentional discrimination. But we got the reports, the Farcon case versus Washington, right? Started in 1996, finally I think resolved at least the last, last part of it in 2010. Um, and in that case, at least early on, the, the trial court found evidence of discrimination in the state. And so we got the reports. We need to do more to relax the kind of drug laws that get our people caught up in drag nets. Some of y'all have relatives who you sub know got stopped and they found even sometimes a marijuana seed or three. And now they're dealing with a criminal record. Uh, and this has a pernicious effect. Costs a lot of money to get a real good attorney, doesn't it? Yeah. 
Yes, it does. People lose jobs when they can't get out on time. And many times when it comes to African Americans, we get the hard end of the law. And when it's non-African Americans, particularly those wider on the scale, they get mercy. I can't believe how they're treating Lindsay Lohan. When I see all this stuff going on, I'm like, what kind of justice is this? Now, if her name was Shanene Lohan, <laughs> she'd be underneath the jail. And so I'm here to support the ACLU's efforts uh, to get us as a community to embrace what they're doing in Olympia to, uh, get to get this law passed. And again, not because I'm trying to encourage our children, our adults, to use marijuana, but because we ought to put it back to uh, the level of a matter of uh, rehabilitation and, uh, and of uh, the level of uh, how we regulate cigarettes and, and all of that. We should be discouraging anything that makes it so that you are living an unhealthy life. Amen? Amen. The last reason I'm here, though, is not just to support what the NAACP is about. It's not just to support what the ACLU is about. But I'm here because I am constantly and continually working to bring a renaissance <coughs> to the African-American community. I want to do that big thing. And we are hurting. The African-American community in the fair city of Seattle, in Kent, Federal Way, uh, wherever you want to, wherever you want to point out, we are the last hired and the first fired. We are underemployed and unemployed. We have more single parent households with heroic mothers often raising their children against all kind of odds and sometimes just barely able to do it despite heroic efforts. We are a community that is incarcerated and we're, the, we're one of the most incarcerated, I'm talking about Washington now, yes. one of the most incarcerated African, we're one of the most incarcerated communities African Americans are on the globe. And something has to be done about it. We got the studies right here. Our incarceration rate in the state of Washington, I'm sorry, our incarceration rate in the United States of America is higher, uh, the incarceration rate of its citizens <coughs> higher than any other industrialized country in the world. Right. In fact, the number two country, we incarcerate people at twice their rate. So we're not just a little bit worse, we are uh, excruciatingly worse. We are, we are worse and it's unconscionable. And then in that situation, what, two minutes? In that situation, <laughs> we are, uh, we are, we, we, we have the incarceration of African Americans. And the incarceration of African Americans is even worse in the state of Washington than it is nationally. Nationally, it's something like, I think, uh, about 5.6, something like that, uh, times the numbers in the population relative to whites. And for African-Americans, something like 6.2 or something. But it's in here, in the report. Something is wrong in the state of Washington. And there is a need to help beyond the marijuana laws, beyond the drug laws. And we need the ACLU and the NAACP and every group in here to get together and start talking about this big thing. Vicki has one of my books, or at least a couple of them over there. When y'all are ready, really, to rebuild our community, I can already see it scripturally. When they talk about Cush in the Bible, that's us. And the Bible says Cush is going to rise. It says Cush is going to rise in Psalm 68. Cush is going to rise in Isaiah 19. Cush is going to rise in 18 of Isaiah and 20. I see it scripturally. I see it historically. In 2011, we're better than we were in 1911. Better than we were in 1811. Better than we were in 1711. But what I'm trying to figure out is not just where we are scripturally, not just where we are historically. Where are we currently? Where are we presently? Where are the leaders and the people that are willing to come together despite the people that say it can't be done. These black folk don't want to get together. Where are, where's that group that's ready to really do it? If you're really ready to do it, 
I want you to know, I want to join you. So those are the three reasons why I'm here. The city of Seattle has a charge called drug traffic loitering. Now basically what that means is two of your friends are hanging out on a street corner, you run into them, you shake their hand, you say, hey, how's it going? Maybe you give a fist bump. Two others walk the other direction and you know what? Some police officers that are sitting up high, one with a telescope, maybe one that's in undercover clothing, uh, a half a block away and another, another standing, maybe even a little bit closer, decide that a drug deal occurred. But once they approach you and they put you up against that wall and they pat you down, they find out you, that you had $7.50 and no drugs whatsoever. So what clearly must have happened is that the person that got away was the person that purchased the drugs. Now I tell you this story because it's the clearest proof that there is absolute racial profiling in the city of Seattle that you can have a crime that shouldn't be a crime because all you did really that they can prove is congregate with two other people. And when I was a public defender, mm -hmm. I handled over a thousand cases and I handled several cases that were called drug traffic loitering. And what I can tell you is I can't remember having ever represented a white person charged with that offense. Mm. It has to end. Mm. This is exactly what happens when you declare an absolute war on drugs. Mm -hmm. And with that, <laughs> we will move on to Major Neil Franklin, Executive Director of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Good. Well, James, there's not much left to say after that from a law enforcement I perspective. I just appreciate it. I'm sorry, brother. <laughs> just kidding. My name's Neil Franklin. I'm a retired uh, member of the law enforcement community from the state of Maryland, and uh, I'm the executive director for Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. I've got over 33 years of law enforcement experience with three different police agencies. My first tour of duty was with the Maryland State Police, where I gave 23 years. And I worked undercover with them back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, I commanded numerous multi-jurisdictional drug task forces in the state of Maryland. And uh, I commanded uh, the two largest training academies, training bureaus in the state of Maryland with the Baltimore Police and the Maryland State Police. And I went on to a third agency, which is Maryland Transit, commanded their detective bureau, a lot of which involved uh, drug investigation, narcotics investigations. And um, I learned a lot over those three decades. And I must say that when I began in the late 1970s, I thought, I really thought that we could keep drugs out of our community. See, because that's what we're, we're, we're trained to believe. And it took me a couple of decades to realize that not only was this impossible, not only were more drugs coming into our communities, because you can't stop it. I mean, bottom line is you can't stop it. You have to learn how to live with it and teach young people to make good decisions <coughs> because there are more legal things in this world that will hurt your children than what's currently illegal. And after a couple of decades, I realized that the biggest problem was not the drugs themselves, because drugs have been part of man's appetite <laughs> since we've been on this rock in many different forms. The biggest problem was the policy. Mm -hmm. It was the policy. And it's a problem for everyone, but it's a serious problem for people of color. It's mm -hmm. a serious problem for blacks mm -hmm. in this country. It wasn't until, let me, let me tell you this story. It wasn't until I was a major at this time in charge of 13 <coughs> narcotics task forces in the eastern half of Maryland. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the state of Maryland, but the eastern shore of Maryland, there ain't a whole lot of blacks. Okay, there's a couple of pockets here and there. Mm -hmm. I had a young investigator, a trooper, uh, undercover uh, narcotics agent come to me 
And I, I, I'm, I was a major. There were many ranks in between his position and mine. And I usually didn't entertain troopers coming to me with their problems. You've got a sergeant, you've got a lieutenant, you've got a captain, let them deal with it. But, but see, the problem was with those folks. Mm -hmm. And he comes to me about his evaluation and his, he says he was rated extremely low as it relates to initiative. So I'm saying, well, so what's that about? He says, well, they tell me I'm not initiating enough cases on my own. Okay, so you gotta get out there and do some work. You see, Major, you don't understand. They're loaning me out to other squads and to other police departments because I'm one of the few black undercover investigators. So what does that tell you? What he was saying was, here on the Eastern Shore of Maryland where there are hardly any blacks, that we're targeting black communities. Now we knew where drugs were being sold and used and dealt in, in the white communities and the gated communities, but see, we didn't enforce these laws there because it was too difficult. You know, the complaints would come in and they'd shut you down and you have all kinds of problems. I'd find myself being demoted and, you know, and the list goes on and on and on. So it, you then begin to realize that there's a problem. But even after that, it was so ingrained in me, mm -hmm. I made note of it, but I really didn't move on it. Unfortunately, it took the loss of a life of someone close to me to get me to stop and to take notice. It took the loss of Corporal Edward Totley, who was assassinated by a drug dealer making a drug buy in Washington, D.C., to realize that it was the policy that was the problem that created a violent community. It shouldn't, it shouldn't take the loss of a life to realize something like that. And, and, and believe me, I, I've got to say this. We're starting to, to see attention to this issue today, this war on drugs, war against black and brown people. We're starting to see that today, but I am ashamed that it is a downturn in the economy that's causing this when we are losing tens of thousands of people in this country and in Mexico and Venezuela and, and Colombia and all our brothers and sisters south of us. And that's been happening for decades, but yet it's, it's taking conversation about money to get us to do something. The, the multitudes of what I'm gonna to speak to about now of our brothers and sisters in prison mm -hmm. nationally federal household surveys, we know that 72% of drug users and sellers in this country are white. 13.5% are black. 37% of those arrested are black across this country. During the height of apartheid in South Africa, we were all in an uproar about that, weren't we? Because they were locking up all these black men at a rate well over 800 per 100,000. That was appalling. In this country, where we imprison more people than any other country, well, as you said, Reverend, we imprison white men at a rate of 948 per 100,000. But for blacks, it's a rate of 4,919 in the year of 2008 in this country per 100,000. If that doesn't wake you up, I don't know what will. There's a book back there that I was looking at earlier that I've read, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. If you haven't read that book, you, it, thank you, Doc. If you haven't read this book, you need to read it. You need to go back there and buy it. I'm going to, from my memory of reading this, when the war on drugs was started under Richard Nixon, and this statement is in this book, Michelle makes reference to one of Nixon's closest aides, a gentleman by the name of H.R. Haldeman, as he's talking about, recanting what Nixon said during one of their meetings. 
And what he said was, this was during uh, uh, the implementation in, of the Southern, what they refer to as the Southern strategy. Nixon says, you know, the problem is really the blacks. And we have to devise a system to deal with that while not appearing to. That's your drug war, folks. On that statement alone, our drug policies should be completely scrapped, done away with, and restructured from the ground up. And I'm ashamed to have been part of enforcing those laws over the past three decades. And now as I begin to close, racial profiling, which, is, which has been a serious issue for us across this country over the past few decades and continues to this day to be a serious issue across this country. The foundation of it is our drug policies. We, police, stop young black people in their cars and as they're walking the street to look for drugs. Yes, there are other things that we profile for too, but overwhelmingly, it is drugs. It is drugs. It is drugs. There's another book by Joseph Cullum. It is called The Black Dragon. He was an investigative reporter in the state of New Jersey. He was the one that broke the story on the New Jersey State Police on a turnpike and their racial profiling practices. You need to read the, the book. He talks about case after case after case after case and the planning of drugs and, and the abuse of black people on that highway and how they stop people. And you know what? It still happens today, but they just changed their tactics a little bit. Believe me, I know. They went, the New Jersey State Police then traveled the country and trained police agencies in 41 states, folks. This is back in the 1980s. And you wonder why we have this issue today? The list is long of our strategies and practices. I'm just giving you a couple. So I encourage you to continue to learn about this issue so that you can make some decisions when it comes time to vote. Change these policies. Mm -hmm. If we end prohibition, if we move forward with I-502, you see, marijuana, of all the drugs being sold illegally today, is well over 50% of what's going on out there. You will strike a serious blow on all levels. Police would then be able to refocus their priorities on crimes against our children, domestic violence, robberies, murders, and so on. In, 19, in the 1960s, before the drug war, we solved 9 out of 10 murders in this country. Today, we only solve 6 out of 10. And this is my final piece. This takes us back to the money. You see, there are many people, and this is why you know, my organization, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, international organization that I manage, it's been around for 10 years. We represent over 50,000 supporters worldwide. We have branches outside of this country. And most of our speakers, we have a speakers bureau of 150, a little over 150 of, of these law enforcement professionals. But see, most of them are retired, and, and so why is that? Let me tell you why it is. See, see, because law enforcement, they get federal dollars. I used to balance the budget for the Baltimore Police Department, and if I didn't have those federal funds coming in from burn grants for dr drug investigations, I'd have to lay a lot of people off. That was, that was close to one-fifth, one-sixth of my budget. In addition to federal funds, we have seized money and property. We call that policing for profit. We don't want these policies to go away. And we speak the truth about this. So as you're making your way to the polls to vote for whatever will change the conditions that we are currently in, you need to continue to educate yourself on this stuff. Teach our kids to make good decisions about life in general. It doesn't matter whether things are legal or illegal. See, because in an illegal environment, drugs are more accessible to your children than in one that's regulated 
and control. You need to understand that. You need to realize that because in an illegal market, you have a store, one person on just about any corner in any neighborhood selling to your kids and they don't want to see a driver's license. All they want to see is money. Thank you. In the late 1960s, Lyndon Baines Johnson, our president, declared a war on poverty until he started to realize how much and how deep he would have to dig and how much money it would actually cost to cure so many, so many of the social ills that have been put in our society institutionally. And then once he realized that, we had to change streams. We had to change directions, move perhaps in a different way. And it's not surprising that our next president would start talking about a war on drugs. What ultimately is a diversionary tactic because we know if we're overeating, if we're becoming addicted to something, it's generally because perhaps we are depressed, perhaps we're not happy with our lot in life, perhaps we have social ills that are impacting our ability to rise up to our natural abilities. Mm -hmm. So we self-medicate. Mm -hmm. So now you can blame it on the drugs if you are the power structure. You can blame it on somebody's use if they are homeless. Instead of talking about educational inequities, instead of talking about incarceration and how it impacts your ability to vote, instead of talking about how for some reason, even when you're similarly situated and you walk into that job interview, you still don't get the job, we can talk about drugs, perception that people must be gang members so they could be drug dealers, and along the line, and that is part and parcel of what comes along with this drug war, is ignoring the real problems in our society. Ignoring the real problems in our society. And with that, with that, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Alice Huffman, President of the California NAACP. I am also a national board member uh -huh. of the NAACP and uh -huh. the chair of the Criminal Justice Committee. Mm -hmm. And with those two hats, I just want to commend my branch that's in my region for yes. showing the kind of leadership that yes. they're showing mm -hmm. to this community. Mm -hmm. This is what the NAACP is supposed to be all about. And I just respect him. I'm glad he's got a little fire in his belly too, huh? Yeah, he got some fire. He got a little fire there. Yeah, we go for it. So I, I have been up here a couple times to visit the NAACP um, state conference, did a training, and been here a couple times. And it's always a pleasure to uh, come up here in this cold, damp <laughs> <laughs> state. But I am uh, intrigued with this pastor. And I'll tell you why, because pastors won't speak out on some of these social issues. It's a big risk. It is a huge risk. And um, the problems are there. They know they are the number one leaders in our community. But they also, many of them, wait and duck the issue. And I'm so proud of you, Pastor, and I am so glad to be on this podium with you tonight. And of course, uh, uh, Mr. Neil Franklin has started to be my partner. We're starting to do a lot of these together because you can't beat the testimony from law enforcement people who've been undercover agents who watched firsthand the destruction that went on in our community and to have the courage, even in retirement, to come out and confess that they have been a part of the problem. We have to really thank him for being here. I start my comments out tonight by telling you I never held a joint. I never smoked pot in my life. I don't know if I ever will, because I'm not one of those who have to know when I don't have to know when I don't have to know. But what I am going to tell you is how embarrassed I am that for 40 years, I was one of those who thought the war on drugs was protecting me and my community. 
I thought the government was doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. I had a sister who used to work in the community. and She used to come home and say, there's a conspiracy going on. They targeting our kids. Well, I had the degree. She didn't have the degree. Mm -hmm. I didn't think she knew what she was talking about. Uh -huh. I thought, they're just doing the right thing. They're going to arrest these little hoodlums and these little thugs and these little uh, dope pushers and clean up the community. Mm -hmm. Did I ever ask myself how the drugs got into the community? Yeah, say that now. Say that. I never asked that question. Mm. Did I ever ask, were, were the laws being applied equally? Mm. As smart as I was, I wasn't smart mm. at all. Not until I became the national, the criminal justice chair of the national NAACP, sitting in a workshop at the national convention, mm -hmm. listening to the drug reform people run out all the statistics mm -hmm. about how this war on drugs is destroying our community. And I'm sitting there, and I go, what? Mm. And they start to show the arrest record. Mm -hmm. And they, they start to show how in fourth grade, they need them. They need them for that prison industrial complex. And they have started in the fourth grade to get those beds ready. And that prison, that prison complex is private. It's privatized. Mm -hmm. That's why Michelle calls it the new form of Jim Crowism. Mm -hmm. It's the new form of slavery. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, once I became educated on, on this, I went home. I was just so. I was just so put out with myself mm -hmm. that I couldn't hear the people around me who wanted to tell me about the sting operations and how they don't protect our community, they police our community, how they come in on Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, they got a ring. Uh, these gentlemen call it fishing. They know where they're going to go. They're going to get our kids. They're going to arrest our kids. They're going to go and ruin the lives of our kids and while they let the other upper class, middle class people go free. Well, I was really taken aback that as smart as I was, you know, I got a Phi Beta Kappa key mm. from UC Berkeley. Shit, sure, I thought I knew something. Uh -huh. And you know, it's, and the light hit you. Mm -hmm. How could you have been asleep that long? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, got, I have a, a, a hundred and two in Sacramento, nieces and nephews and grand nieces and nephews and so forth. And you know, I have watched them, I have policed them. They couldn't come to my house with a joint. They couldn't come. I was as bad as law enforcement. Not once did I think, oh, maybe they need treatment. Not once did I think, oh, maybe this is a health issue. Not once did I think, oh, this is a social issue that's been caused by something else. Not once did I think that. How could I have had my head in the sand that long mm -hmm. and watch lives get destroyed? Mm -hmm. And so I went back to California, and lo and behold, they had a proposition called Proposition 19. Uh -huh. Now, I know people want to wonder, well, what did it do? Mm -hmm. Well, it didn't go quite far enough for me. Although, as NACP, I can't really say how far it should go. But I'm like these people here. Prohibition doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But I said, here's an opportunity. I have been educated. What is the point in getting information if you don't act on it? Right. Yeah. What is the point of being an NAACP leader if you got no courage? Yeah. And I said, National doesn't have a policy on this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to support Proposition 19. Well, I had to get my 33 board, executive committee members together and mm -hmm. smooth them and dump, took them over the house and gave them some food. And, you know, I, mm -hmm. I did all that stuff where they could listen. Mm -hmm. And then I ran the facts out. Mm -hmm. And I was able to get them to vote mm -hmm. that we would join in mm -hmm. to pass Proposition 19 mm -hmm. in the state of California mm -hmm. to lead to, um, it was to legalize marijuana. Mm -hmm. But I didn't get in it to encourage anyone to smoke pot. Mm -hmm. I got in it because any time we can chip away at an injustice, we need mm -hmm. to do it. That's right. Now, people, the, some clergy got mad at me, Pastor. Mm -hmm. I got cars from all across, they the, mad at me. all across the country asking mm -hmm. me to resign. They didn't know how I got elected. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know that as long as my state conference didn't ask me to resign, right. mm -hmm. I didn't have to resign. National got a little bit of, you know, they got a little, when the news hit national, mm -hmm. 
They went looking at their policies. They went see if, if they could come and shut me down. And when I went to board meeting, they tried to shut me down and say, well, you know, just because there's no policy, that doesn't mean you can do what you want to do in California, <laughs> thanks to Ben Jealous, my new exec. He said, I just think she's doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Well, let's shut that down. Mm -hmm. And so since National didn't have a policy, I, we joined in this campaign. Now, I, my point is, one person can make a difference. Mm. I didn't join the campaign because Normal and all the people who like to smoke pot and wanted to do it for leisure. I wanted to tell my community that we're in a bad set of policies that's been run by our government. Like slavery was bad government policy. Yeah. Separate but equal was bad government policy. Mm -hmm. Ban on interracial marriage is bad government policy. Jim Crowism is bad government policy. And the war on drugs that was born out of racism is a bad government policy. This war didn't start with Nixon. It started before Nixon. He just escalated it. Back early, around the 20s, when they created the Bureau, whatever they call on narcotics to ban some of these things, uh -huh. they did it because the white women were falling for the black jazz musicians in New Orleans. <laughs> and they said, we got to do something about this. And, and we got to stop them. It's that, it ain't the music, it's the marijuana. That's how it got started. This is a law that's based on racism. Mm -hmm. Now, anybody in this room, whether you clergy, I tell my clergy, the ones that listen to me now, yeah. <laughs> that I'm not out here saving souls. Mm -hmm. I ain't getting in your Kool-Aid on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out here changing laws. Mm -hmm. Anytime government has a law that oppresses your people, we are supposed to rise up and change it. Right. Now, uh -huh. I'm going to make a statement or two. Since we won't put anything on the ballot, mm -hmm. we black folks I'm talking about, right. we won't get the money and design it the way yeah. we want it. Mm -hmm. Maybe because we don't have all the resources to do it or whatever, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Then grab a hold of somebody else's and make it work for you. I don't care what their motive is. We got a different motive. Don't get caught up on their motive. Mm -hmm. I know, you know, when, when whites and blacks fought together to end slavery, I'm sure some of them had different motives for being in the abolitionist movement. Mm -hmm. We didn't care. Some people said Abraham Lincoln didn't free us because he loved blacks. He freed us to save the country. I don't care. I am free. I don't care what the motive was. Right, right, right. Don't try to impugn the man and try to make him love black folks. Change the law. White, many white people today don't love the laws that we live under, but they have to abide by them. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have to take the law. Now, their initiative is not perfect for me. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go far enough for me, mm -hmm. but it goes. Mm -hmm. And if we want, we, we were able, I started telling you about one person making a difference. They uh -huh. couldn't shut me down in California. The NACP got national news, international news. All of a sudden, the little ditty bobbers in the street were saying, right on, sister. All of a sudden, we were relevant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we were relevant. Uh -huh. They're saying, where is my NACP? Mm -hmm. Do something that makes my life better. Mm -hmm. We were relevant. And so we were able, thanks to a few of my brave uh, fellow uh, NACP leaders, we came together. We got us a little scheme going. We're at the next convention, which was in LA. We were going to pass a resolution to end the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. That's not where we started. The word got back that we were going to have a marijuana res a resolution on the floor, so everybody got ready for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we put one on to end the war on drugs. Right. Now, who could fight that when you look at the statistics? Mm -hmm. So one person, with a lot of other people's help, yeah as a change agent, can yeah. make a difference. Uh -huh. Each of you can make a difference. Mm -hmm. You cannot come to a forum like this and hear the facts mm -hmm. and go home and do nothing. Mm -hmm. How are you going to educate your children if you can't keep them in school? Mm -hmm. 
I'm an educator. I was trying to do the educational thing. I hadn't paid attention how many of our kids were incarcerated, mm. how they were just plucking them off, zero tolerance, one thing or another, mm. all of it mostly around dope. Mm. I want to see the little gang bangers get turned into to some legitimate businesses. Yeah. The violence on our corner comes because they ain't got no jobs, and all they have is marijuana. And so, you know, when we, when we legalize it, we got to find some things that bright young men and women. Mm -hmm. We got to find some other opportunities for them. Mm -hmm. My message tonight is I'm asking each of you to support that initiative, mm -hmm. to work to pass that initiative, to get just a little nose under the tent of mm -hmm. turning this war on drugs around. If we can do this in every state, little by little, this war will fail. When this war on drugs fail, they treat our addicted people like they got a health issue and not a criminal record. When they stop making felons out of them so they lose their future uh, economic viability forever, when we stop all of that, we will have done something. Thanks. I can't help but remember and note a study that I saw in the earth early 1990s. And that study was in relation to, it was in relation to the cost of incarceration. But what was interesting about this study, and it was done in the state of Illinois, is they looked at what different people represented in terms of circulated dollars to their community. Mm -hmm. And what they realized is those African American children that were taken out of urban Chicago and moved out to rural Illinois mm -hmm. actually represented about three or four thousand dollars per year in circulated dollars in urban Chicago. Mm. Now that means that people in their neighborhood could work in the grocery stores and the likes, they bought food, all of those things. But what became really remarkable is what they represented in dollars to those rural communities that had the prisons. Uh -huh. $40,000 a pop. Mm. So what that means is the little person, the, the, the man working in a 7-Eleven at 9 to 10 to 12 bucks an hour at that time would now be able to get a job for $40,000 a year or something similar because a black kid, probably under the age of 25, was moved from urban Chicago mm -hmm. to rural Illinois behind bars. But of course that can't happen here, right? We don't have prisons in Monroe, Washington where there's almost no black people. We don't have prisons no, in Walla Walla no, where there's haven't. almost no black people. Uh -huh. And we could go on so on so forth, uh -huh. Cedar Creek, Stafford Creek, mm -hmm. several hours, several miles all over the place. Yeah, and the same. question that I'd have to ask you is what do you think that our black children represent in terms of dollars to those neighborhoods? to those towns that are not our own, uh -huh. to those places do not have uh, people that look like us in those communities, uh -huh. for that person that is now profiting off of what ultimately is indentured servitude slash slavery. Uh -huh. And what supports this and what justifies uh, people being able to make $40,000, and I'll be real with you, I work as a criminal defense attorney, and every time I walk into a courtroom in the city of Seattle, mm -hmm. in the county of Martin Luther King Jr., I feel as though I have walked into the realm, not of the slave ship, but the bartering path. Here we have a brother who's strong, he can do all this work for you, perhaps, and on one side, the defense attorney is arguing, don't give him too much time, he's strong, he's capable, he's this, he's that. They're saying, no, he's bad, that brother's gotta do a little more work for us for about 15 years. What we're gonna do is we're gonna send him somewhere in the middle of the night. He's gonna be so far away that he can't actually experience what it's like to maintain and build his family. He's gonna be that far away, and oh, by the way, we will collect our dollars too, because that guy that's working at the 7-Eleven, who chances are he is a white man in Monroe, Washington, now has the opportunity to put a badge on his chest, act as if he's superior, tell a black kid when he can and can't leave his room, his cell, and then collect $40,000 at the end of it and vote for policies that put more black people in prison. And so the question 
when we deal with, with bills like this one, and hopefully bills that will be even stronger in the you, future, man. is hey. do we want to end hey. disproportionate incarceration yeah. in the state of Washington? Yeah. Do we want to end slavery in the state of Washington? Uh -huh. Because that's what it is, and we shouldn't pretend that it isn't. Uh -huh. So let's, uh, let's deal with that. I think Brother James should uh, be a leap speaker because we should be sending him around the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Speaking of uh, around the world, this, this question here uh, refers to Brazil and some of the things they are uh, doing in, in Brazil. Uh, since they're finally uh, taking big steps to address the drug <coughs> violence in the favelas, and which are the, the slums in Brazil by uh, implementing um, a process of occupation and pacification. We just got back from Brazil. As a matter of fact, Leap, we have a branch in Rio, in Brazil. And just a couple months ago, we had a convening in Brazil of 30 law enforcement officials, high-ranking officials from around the world. First of all, they have literally close to a thousand of these areas, slums, favelas in, in Brazil, and we toured one where they've implemented the strategy of reclaiming this territory from drug dealers and the violent drug dealers, and they've had so many cops killed, they've had so many civilians killed in these favelas that they, they, they implemented this program. Yes, you can what you've done here is, is taken this favela back, but all you've done was push the dealers out to other favelas. And you don't, you never will have the resources to take back 1,000 favelas. You just, it's just impossible to do. And then if you somehow were able to do that, you just push it out of Rio to other parts of Brazil. I have two questions. The first one, the writer writes, if you are suggesting that we, as a community, should vote for legalized weed, then what are your plans for our black teens, young men who drop out of school and, and stand on street corners and sell drugs, who have no plans, no jobs, no education, no hope? It seems like everything that you cited here is what's going on now. This drug war has been going on for 40 years the war on drugs. Black teens, young men drop out of school, they stand on the corners now. They stand on the corners now because they can get weed and sell weed because it's illegal. You don't see them standing out there selling alcohol because people can go, alcohol is regulated. They go in the store and buy alcohol. You don't even see them standing out there selling cigarettes even though in some states they cost so much a pack you would think there'd be an underground market but they don't even sell cigarettes because there's no, there's no money in it. There's no charm in it. It's not illicit. So I would think that if we could start to realize that we need to educate like we've educated people on cigarettes. I remember when I smoked, and I was cool, and I smoked cools. And then, all of a sudden, I started to get the information that I was killing myself. Then I got to, every time I had a cigarette, I felt like I was committing suicide. So I put the cigarette down. I put the cigarette down because I'm too vain to kill myself. But I would never stop smoking if I hadn't had the information. And so what we need is for government to regulate these drugs, test these drugs, inform the public on how to use these drugs, and make sure that young people can't get these drugs on the streets because it, there's a market for it. And that underground market is what's destroying our community. So to the person who asked this question, I would think um, uh, decriminalizing drugs, that's really great. Legalizing drugs is when the answer's gonna come because you gotta get it off the streets. Yeah, I, um, I got a couple of questions here. First, we had one question we weren't even going to answer, but then as I thought about it, I said we ought to say something to it. It says, what information you can share, that's what it says here, what information you can share regarding the dual diagnosis of schizophrenia, schizophrenia 
and crack cocaine. Suffice it to say, it's a highly addictive substance. There's some people that I know that have been able to handle a cocaine problem that they did mainly on the weekends or when they got their paycheck uh, twice a month. And then when they got broken and went to crack cocaine, they couldn't handle it. It was too addictive for them. And they spiraled downward. So even if there is a connection somehow with schizophrenia, I don't think it takes away from the fact that somehow people are bringing in a tremendous amount of a highly addictive substance. And it ain't black people bringing it, bringing the, the basic elements of that drug to this country. You can't bring an apple in from Fiji on an airplane. You can't sneak in on a sub just to, you know, get around Canada's laws and sit on the beach in Washington and sneak back on a sub. But how they're bringing ship loads of these drugs in here and airplane loads of these drugs here getting away with, I'm telling you. And there was one 60 Minutes report on it in which they caught the DEA bringing in, or maybe it was the DEA that caught another agency, bringing in uh, a jet load of drugs in. And they said, well, we, we brought that in just so that we could learn uh, Pablo Escobar's MO. And then they went after Pablo Escobar. I don't think so. That uh, the book Dark Alliance, the CA and crack cocaine uh, by uh, uh, Gary Webb that broke in a line of articles starting in the San Jose Mercury the San Jose News Mercury. Mm -hmm. sometime around about 1998. Right. He was on to something. He stumbled into that case just trying to catch up with Ricky Ross because he heard he was the big drug dealer. And when he met with Ricky Ross, Ricky Ross said, Ricky Ross said, ask them about Danello and Manessis, the ones they don't want to go after, who supplied me. Come on, somebody. So let's not get caught up on diagnoses and things like this when we got some big stuff to talk about. Something crazy is going on in here. <laughs>